This is A to Z with Mark Zinno, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, and it starts now. Good afternoon. Welcome to A to Z here on Locked On Sports Atlanta, where today I tell you, I think we're in trouble. Welcome in here on this Monday. Appreciate you guys starting your week with me here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Give me a follow on Twitter at Mark Zeno. Follow us at Locked On ATL. Keep up with all the great shows on the Locked On Sports Atlanta network. Certainly, again, appreciate you guys starting your Monday with us. we got a big show for you today. Brad Rowland of Locked On Hawks will join us as we recap Game one, look forward to game two here as well. We have some more Falcons draft news to get to, and the Braves will see an old friend coming up later on tonight. But we start with game one of the NBA playoffs of the Atlanta Hawks against the Miami Heat. And uh, guys, I think the Hawks are in trouble. Um, I don't know how anybody else viewed the game. I don't even look at the final score. I didn't even look at the box score. Um, because I know that that's not going to be indicative of sort of the way the series will play out. The Hawks aren't going to get blown out by 20 in every single game. That's not why I think we're in trouble. And I certainly understand that the Hawks were the victim of a situation, right? Remember, they played the final regular season game in Houston. So they were in Houston. Then two days later, they went home to play the Hornets. Two days later, flew to Cleveland to play the Cavaliers. And then two days later, flew and played the Miami Heat. So they flew to three different cities over the course of six days and played three games. This team was exhausted. Um, they were tired, and you could tell it was taking its toll on them physically uh, and emotionally, right? I mean, they played two elimination games. There was some talk going into the game, and I certainly understood it, that maybe because the Hawks had been in playoff mode for two games, they might be a little bit sharper, a little bit more crisp versus a Miami team that had a week off. Uh, and there's that rest versus rust scenario. Uh, and I think that certainly was valid, but Miami didn't show any of that. And the Hawks looked more, more tired than anything else in the game. So I, I, I kind of make sure I understand all that when I put this thing in context. But what makes me feel like the Hawks were in trouble um, is the way things went down in the first half and into the third quarter and how the Hawks were defended by the Miami Heat. Now, Miami, statistically, is right on par with Cleveland. As far as points allowed per game, Miami is number four in the NBA, and Cleveland is number five. The Hawks were able to score on Cleveland. They were not able to score on Miami. The Hawks were able to get Trey Young going in the second half against Cleveland. That did not happen against Miami. The Hawks were able to get other people involved in the offense against Cleveland. That did not happen against Miami. Uh, and that was alarming to me. Now, you could say Miami is well-rested and the Hawks were tired. That's true. But the Hawks were neighbor, never able to get anything going offensively, not in the beginning of the game, not for a stretch in the second quarter, not towards the end of the first half, not at all in the third quarter. I mean, it just never clicked. Miami's defense is on a whole different level than Cleveland. And that, to me, is a little bit worrisome that they are so good at shutting the Hawks down. I feel like this is a matchup nightmare for Atlanta, so much so that part of me feels like they almost rushed John Collins back due to the Capella injury. I mean, think about this, right? If Capella is not injured, is John Collins playing in this game? And I'm not saying that John Collins wasn't ready. I'm not saying that the Hawks forced, forced him. I'm not saying that, that any of those, this isn't anything nefarious. I'm just saying that, again, if John Collins was ready to play, why didn't he play in the elimination game? Like that's when you need him more than you need him in the game one. So to me, it is 100% you know, fair to question if Capella hadn't been injured, would John Collins have been in the game? Because he wasn't exactly effective, right? And there are two things about John Collins not being effective that really kind of worry me. One of them is defensively because you're missing Capella. Um, but the other part is offensively. He scored nine points in 21 minutes off the bench, mind you. Uh, and I wasn't expecting a 20-point a outburst or a 25-point night. Um, but clearly he didn't shoot that much and he's not as comfortable. And the reports are that it's the finger on his shooting hand is the thing that's giving him a lot more trouble than anything else. And so from that standpoint, you know, this is a, uh, 
this is a situation where, you know, the the Hawks are needing offensive help for Trey. Like they need somebody who can create more offense. And I've said that about Collins and how important he is to getting Trey going on nights like that. When Miami is keying on Trey, if somebody else is making shots, that's going to divert tension away. And, and nobody else was making shots. And John Collins is the one consistent scorer on this team that puts up 20 on a routine basis that you have to respect and defend. And if he's not 100% healthy, he can't do that. And so if John Collins can't be an effective scorer, where's the scoring coming from? I mean, I mean, I said that they got it from everybody in the game against Charlotte. You know, they got, they got multiple contributions in the game against Cleveland. They didn't get anything from everybody, and the Hawks got shut down. Um, and, and again... I'm fully factoring into the tired context of this whole thing, and I certainly think that that played into the way the game unfolded. And I'm curious to see how the Hawks respond in game two. But Miami's defense is eye-opening. It's like, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're like, you see my eyes like, whoa. You know, like bug out of your head. Like these guys are all over the place kind of, uh, kind of defense. And the Miami depth to me, I think, is going to be a problem. You know, in reality, they can still get to seven or eight deep, uh, and it's not going to be an issue. You know, again, I, and and Duncan Robinson had 21 uh, or 27 it was in the game, and well, that's certainly not normal. I don't think you're you're going to um, you're going to have to worry about him doing that on a routine basis throughout the rest of the series. But Tyler Hero only had six, and he went three from 11 from the field, like he was ineffective, uh, and they were still able to be in full control the whole time. Uh, so uh, their depth to me. Is, is a problem. Bam and Abayo didn't have a great game either, and they still found a way to continue to put up points. I mean, P.J. Tucker was on fire yesterday from three. At some point in time, they're going to have to put a body on him uh, and figure this out. But the Hawks really got no help from anybody. And outside of, of Bogdanovich, you know, off the bench, um, you know, where's the real depth? Okongu is a nice player, but – I don't think Okongwu is going to be a guy that's going to swing this series in a different direction, right? So if you put Collins back in the starting lineup and Okongwu goes to the bench after Bogdanovich, where's the depth for the Hawks? Miami can literally continue to rotate and just wear the Hawks down on the defensive end so much so that they don't score on the offensive end. So I am highly concerned about where the Hawks are and feel like they're headed for a gentleman sweep unless something, I think they'll definitely get one at home. Unless somehow they can steal a game in game two. Now, full disclosure, again, I am, from a betting standpoint, I'm back in the Hawks in game two, uh, plus seven and a half, because I don't think that box score is indicative of how competitive the Hawks can be against Miami. But I do have concerns about the Hawks' defense more than their offense. I think their offense will get right when they get rested, right? Um, I think their offense will, will, will uh, they don't have to get on a plane, so they'll, they'll have a full day off to do nothing. Um, and get their bodies recuperated and then still have time to go through a game plan, not play a day game. They're playing a night game on Tuesday. So a, a lot of that's certainly going to help. But I don't know defensively if the Hawks can do anything to slow down Miami's offense. And Miami's offense isn't great, but the Hawks have to find a way to be better on the defensive end. If they're not, and Miami can routinely get above 110, their offense is good enough to hold the Hawks below 110, right? Um, if they get to 115 and hold the Hawks to 110, the Hawks really didn't have a bad scoring night because 120 every night is unrealistic, even though that's what they've been averaging. You get in the one teens, you know, 13, 14. But if the Hawks don't play defense, it's going to be a real problem. It's going to be a real problem. Like I said, I think they get one at home, but uh, Miami's defense is legit. They are the real, real thing. All right, coming up next, uh, Brad Rowland of Locked On Hawks will join us, part of our Locked On Network, and we're going to talk to him and get his thoughts exactly on the future fate of the Atlanta Hawks. Plus, later on in the show, we'll get into the Falcons and an old friend coming back to see the Atlanta Braves. That's next right here on A to Z on Locked On Sports Atlanta, free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. search Locked On Sports Atlanta. 